for this. Okay. I can give a crack at it. Sure. Um, so when he's going on ideas and perceptions and thoughts, he's basically saying previous experiences um, kind of articulate what we experience in the now. And so almost as if we like live in our preconceived notions of what reality is, opposed to experiencing what reality truly is. At first, he kind of warrants like um, the idea that thoughts, ideas, perceptions are secondary and reality is primary. But then he kind of elaborates of like, well, what is primary, but like accumulation of our perceptions of how we experience this present moment or something to that effect. And then he kind of begins to question like the primary or like how do we conceive the primary? Like how do you know we're experiencing what is real is real? And we're not like kind of, you know, I guess captive by our by our ideas and thoughts. And so he tries distinguishing them, the difference, and then the lines kind of get merged for me. Uh, I didn't quite understand. At the end of it, what I kind of got was um, like, it's kind of things like my annotations, I mean, it's kind of basically said like, in the mind is secondary, you know that you wouldn't be experiencing, like if you touch fire, it's really real, but if you think fire, you're not gonna experience the same effect. And that is true, but then he had correlated like disease and being mad to actually having that experience. But I, many people have had that experience without being mad or ill, where what your mind can do can simulate reality. And we've talked about in our past readings and things like that, so we're gonna go into it. But um, yeah, I just argue that the consciousness is very strong. And so then I think that's the fundamental kind of back and forth I experienced in the reading. So that was my best crack for now. But yeah, so um, yeah, there's a lot of good stuff there. Does anyone want to add uh, to what Joshua just said? So I noticed in what Joshua just offered, he sometimes used perception um, as synonymous with thought or idea, and sometimes with what he, he presented or described as the base reality, which is um, what I'm thinking. My interpretation of what he said is uh, what is given to our senses or our experience through, in Hume's language, impressions, right? And so um, there's a sort of ambiguity or a sort of um, tension in early modern thought uh, that, that Hume identifies in our reading. Um, where did it go? Ah. Really in um, this big footnote that is presented as part of the text in this particular version of the book um, uh, between pages nine and 10. So on page 10, for example, he says, the word idea seems commonly to be taken in a very loose sense by Locke and others. And he would, Hume would include Descartes in that too. So idea seems commonly be, to be taken in a very loose sense by Locke and others who use it to stand for any of our perceptions, sensations, and passions, as well as thoughts. So, um, what is it that marks legitimate knowledge according to Descartes' epistemological framework? When can you really know something to be true? Well, it's when that knowledge is, to use the language um, at issue or applicable for this week, when it's a priori, which means it's absolutely um, indubitable. It's absolutely certain. It cannot be doubted. And he has a specific way of describing that. So such knowledge comes up in our thinking in the form of what he calls clear and distinct ideas. And he sometimes uh, uses the alternative language of clear and distinct perceptions, right? So ideas and perceptions are more or less interchangeable. So from the Cartesian point of view, when I am physically staring with my eyes at this coffee cup and holding it in my hand, I have simultaneously a visual uh, perception, which uh, would be, um, for Descartes, a kind of visual perceptual idea of the coffee cup, just as I also have a tactile um, perception, which would be then described as a tactile perceptual idea. And then later on, when I put the cup down or leave the room, I can conjure up a mental image of it. I can remember what it looked like. 
But now I have a simply um, um, uh, imagistic idea or a mnemonic idea. That is an idea grounded in my memory, but I'm still relating as a subject to the object, which is the coffee cup, but through different modes um, of intentional experience. So one mode is perceptual, but it's still an idea. And another mode is imagistic or takes place through memory, but it's still an idea, right? And so Hume is calling attention to some problems that have arisen as a consequence of this ambiguity or of this um, fundamental confusion. Uh, and it's a problem that even an early empiricist like John Locke uh, suffered from in his thinking. And so um, that's really what motivates this distinction, uh, impressions um, versus ideas. That's why he says at the very beginning of our reading, so in uh, section two, when he says, everyone will freely admit that the perceptions of the mind when a man feels the pain of excessive heat or the pleasure of moderate warmth are considerably unlike what he feels when he later remembers this sensation or earlier looks forward to it in his imagination. So using the coffee cup example, it's undeniable that there is a distinct difference, a qualitative difference between my immediate perception of the cup and my later thinking or imagining the cup. But that um, apparently obvious difference is lost in the language of these early modern philosophers, in particular Descartes and Locke. Um, so does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. I just, I mean, you're kind of, I've been, this is my third philosophy class, I believe, but um, it really just kind of hit me like how intimate the philosophy community is, like the philosophers, like how they're kind of, you know, speak about each other, go off each other's ideas, argue for each other from all different time periods. And mm -hmm. it's kind of like one close knit community of philosophers. It's pretty cute. <laughs> yeah, it's an ongoing trans historical dialogue, right? And we're engaging right now in that dialogue with, with Hume. Right? We are talking with Hume, so to speak. We're communicating with him um, over the, the, across the span of hundreds of years that separate us, which is, um, I think, really beautiful. And last week, we were doing that over the span of 2,000 years, going back to Plato. Um, and, and Hume himself engages with the Socratic uh, figure, the sort of Socratic um, skepticism, as Hume puts it, although I wouldn't consider Socrates a skeptic. Uh, but um, that's the affinity that Hume finds um, from 2000 years prior that is influencing and guiding the direction of his thought, uh, which is it's very interesting. So yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, okay, so um, hopefully you guys had some, some good discussion, um, but if it's unclear exactly what this distinction is, we'll work through that. But there's a lot to unpack in this reading. Um, so are there any, any comments or, or questions? Does anyone else want to take a stab at the definitional distinction? No? All right, well, um, I'm gonna to jump into a slideshow that I prepared. Um, I'll probably end up jumping over a number of these slides. Um, there's there are quite a few of them. And so we'll, we'll continue this on Thursday before applying this philosophy to uh, the Guy de Maupassant story, or, or more, accurately, more accurately, we'll be using the Guy de Maupassant story, the Horla, to, um, in a powerful or evocative sense, gain some, some clarity and understanding of what Hume is up to. Uh, but here is a, a, a short timeline of early modern philosophy beginning in the 17th century, so the 1600s. Uh, so we've already read some um, of Descartes' meditations. So we've read the first two meditations that was published in 1641. Uh, so that's Descartes, this is Locke, that's George Berkeley, David Hume, and then if you can see Immanuel Kant over here, these are the major early modern philosophers. Um, Kant is, is, and Hume are really considered um, modern proper philosophers. So they're probably no longer early modern once you get to human Kant. Um, 
But in 1689, John Locke published his essay concerning human understanding, which we didn't read directly. Uh, I didn't want to murder you with boredom, uh, but that's where we found Locke's idea of personhood um, and his account of personal identity that we worked through in the context of the first two nights of the John Perry dialogue. Uh, and so that was in, in many respects, a response to what Descartes had already given in his meditations on first philosophy and also his um, equally significant discourse on the method. And then now having gotten into the early part of the 18th century, we encounter George Berkeley, uh, who published his Principles of Human Understanding in 1710, largely motivated by this desire to <laughs> excoriate John Locke and to ridicule him. And he did an excellent job of that, I would say. <laughs> And we'll talk a little bit about Barclay's uh, really dramatic and surprising, and in some sense, strangely, simultaneously counterintuitive and very much intuitive <laughs> argumentative conclusion. Um, and Barclay is an odd figure in the history of philosophy in that he is simultaneously um, an empiricist, so a forerunner to people like, um, or to, to the figure uh, centrally under discussion this week, David Hume, so he's an empiricist, but he's also an idealist. <laughs> uh, and then that's a very strange combination. And we'll talk about what that means. And then Hume was influenced or motivated in his uh, treatise of human nature. And so that's uh, where we, we got section six on personal identity from last time. Uh, and then roughly a decade later, he published an inquiry concerning human understanding, which is where we're getting uh, the readings from this week, uh, the excerpts from this week. And then Kant in 1781 published his monumental groundbreaking critique of pure reason, which is among the most important works uh, ever published in the history of philosophy. And as I mentioned last time we encountered Hume, uh, Kant himself claimed that he was awoken from his dogmatic slumber by Humean um, empiricist philosophy. Um, and so he was aw awoken from this dogmatism uh, this kind of obliviousness by Hume's challenge, and that's what motivated his critical turn. Uh, okay, so this is just to give some historical context to what we're talking about here. And so we can divide these modern schools of thought into the camps that track these fundamental divisions or branches of philosophy, so metaphysics and epistemology. So in metaphysics, we have realism and idealism, and we'll map out the various philosophers, we'll locate them on this uh, landscape in terms of a combination of drawing from both metaphysics and epistemology. So according to metaphysical realism, there is a mind independent reality. So it might strike you as odd that there is a particular philosophical school of thought which arrives at the conclusion which all of us presuppose <laughs> or quite naturally take for granted, right? That there is a world out there, <laughs> that there is a really existing universe beyond the confines of our ordinary consciousness. Um, but there are different kinds of realism. So maybe the sort of a pre-reflective, not very thoughtful knee-jerk approach to a, re to a, a realist orientation um, is, is naive realism, and that's maybe what marks uh, the non-philosophical attitude towards the world and one's relation to it. So naive realism says, um, first of all, as the fundamental claim of realism proper, that there is in fact a reality outside of our relational um, orientations to it, whether in experience, sensation, thought, consciousness, um, science, philosophy, religion, whatever else, um, but the naive realism takes the additional unwarranted step of further claiming that that mind independent reality is in existence more or less along the lines in which or according to which we perceive it or apprehend it. So there is no substantive gap, so to speak, according to the naive realist between reality as, exists, as it exists and the way in which we are conscious of that reality or come to know it or experience it. Um, representational realism, and here's where we find thinkers like Descartes, 
and also Locke, even though, as we'll see, uh, Descartes is a rationalist epistemologically, whereas Locke is an empiricist, they're both representational realists and that they hold, first of all, that there is a mind independent reality, um, but they deny the claim and conclusion of the naive realist and say, um, there is a mind independent reality, but the way in which we access it or come to experience or know it doesn't necessarily mirror accurately the state of that mind independence. Um, so there could in fact be um, maybe even an unbridgeable gap between our consciousness of the world, the structures of our knowing and the very content of that knowledge. Uh, and then there is idealism. And so that's where we find Bishop George Barclay who was responding to Locke and, and also Descartes to some extent. Um, so idealism denies realism of all varieties. The idealist says there is in fact no mind independent reality. Everything that exists, exists as an idea in some mind or consciousness. Okay. So does that make sense? I mean, we'll walk through this with some examples. Uh, and then epistemology. So to get to this side of things, there is rationalism, uh, a representative of which would be Descartes. And this is the view that all knowledge comes from reason or the intellect or subjectivity, right? One's um, conscious capacities by which we engage the world. Uh, um, but importantly, through a kind of um, mediated contact um, as opposed to empiricism, which says, no, all knowledge ultimately comes from sensation, from perception or more broadly sense experience. And so that's where we encounter people like Locke Barclay um, and also Hume. Hume being the sort of radical, um, extreme, um, hyperbolic, you might say, apotheosis or, um, um, uh, or apex of this trajectory um, in the intellectual history that we're engaging with. Uh, and so we'll, we'll talk exactly, we'll talk about exactly the ways in which um, Hume's empiricism are quite radical and the implications of that. Okay, so that makes sense. These two broad uh, areas that you can encounter within metaphysics and epistemology. Any questions about that? All right. So in the third meditation, which we didn't read, we encounter <laughs> a, a sort of um, proto that is not fully articulated criticism or critique of what I just described as naive realism. So in the third meditation, really early on in this meditation, Descartes makes a curious observation. He says, now the principal and most frequent error to be found in judgment consists in the fact that I judge that the ideas which are in me are similar to or in conformity with certain things outside me. So unless it's clear when you read a, a claim like this, when you read a proposition like this, that for Descartes idea, as we were describing or discussing earlier, idea means at the same time, our perceptual experiences, the content of those perceptual experiences, um, our intellectual calculations, what we imagine, what we remember, what we think of what we're conscious, what we feel, all of these things are encapsulated under this um, really taxed, I would say, and pushed to its limit um, umbrella concept of the idea. And that's where uh, Hume comes in with his challenge when he says um, on page 10 of our reading, the word idea seems commonly to be taken in a very loose sense by Locke and others who use it to stand for any of our perceptions, sensations and passions, as well as thoughts. So what is Descartes saying here? Um, this is the error of the naive realist. The naive realist says, I perceive what I take to be a coffee cup sitting before my eyes on the table. And I think that when I leave the room, when I go home at the end of the day, the state of affairs out there in reality, out there in the room, independently of my experience is precisely the same. There's absolutely no difference. Um, 
And so what's the, why would Descartes think that this is the principal and most frequent error? So what is an error that is almost promised, that's almost guaranteed by this um, fundamental presupposition of naive realism? So what's the problem with the idea, according to the naive realist, that mind independent reality exists in precisely the ways that our mind reveals that reality and there's no difference. I feel like with these conversations, like I wanna kind of have a more expanded concept or thought process. It seems like typically it's pretty simple, you know, but uh, so I'll give it a crack. Um, so the naive realism, critical error, people have perceptions of reality and assume that uh, is in uh, alignment with, you know, what's outside of them or that there's similarities and such. Um, I mean, I feel like, you know, there's some warrant to that thought process. And then I was having a conversation with a guy from Nigeria today. And he's like, man, it's so good to be here. It's so safe and so nice. I'm like, oh. I hate Ashland, people are so stuck up. So I don't know, just like people are just different. Like, he's like, oh, it's so drama free. I'm like, really? I can't even wave at anyone up getting a smirk. And he's like, no, you know, go to Russia for a bit. You'll really appreciate it here. <laughs> it's like, all right, cool. So he's like in a paradise. He's like in paradise and I'm like in hell, you know, so. Yeah, so, I mean, I think you're calling attention to the fact that two people can experience the same so-called mind independent reality yet come to radically different judgments about the nature of that reality, right? In terms of value, for example, that seems pretty straightforward. Yeah. Um, but uh, this is a kind of essential phenomenological point. So phenomenology is the science of appearances, how things appear in the order of consciousness, intersubjective consciousness. So I might be conscious of some aspects of the world that are at the moment inaccessible to you because they're not a part of your immediate milieu. They're not around you. Um, but if you were to come into that milieu, if you were to share my space, we would experience the world in roughly um, comparative or analogical or similar terms, right? So we could have uh, a shared content about which or around which we could have a meaningful conversation, right? Um, but uh, so this image here is, is the so-called Cartesian theater. So this is an example of representational realism. So this dude is in his kitchen cooking some eggs, and it might seem that perceptually, in terms of his manipulation of the pan, the way his eyes access the presence of the eggs on the stove, um, the way his ears are able to pick up, the crackling of the sound as it cooks and so forth, it might seem that all of these sense modalities give the individual depicted here an immediate contact with the real. But according to Descartes, that contact is mediated by a representation or an idea of the experience. And there is always a separation or a kind of gap between the mental content of that idea and the objective reality of which it is a representation. And so sometimes, as in this case, the idea of representation can be understood to be rather accurate, um, but it's not always accurate. And that's when we run into perceptual errors in judgment, right? So um, if I were to take a fistful of, of LSD or, uh, <laughs> or mescaline or something like that right now, I could hallucinate for example, that Sammy Davis Jr., the great dancer, is in the corner of my office giving me a little tap dance performance, right? I might hallucinate that. And I would not be wrong. It would not be an error at all if I told you <laughs> um, I'm experiencing Sammy Davis Jr. tap dancing for me right now in my office. That's not a false statement. That would not be false at all. The error <laughs> would come about if I took the additional unwarranted step, this is Descartes' point, and said, um, I'm not simply experiencing the idea of Sammy Davis Jr. tap dancing in my office, but as an objective fact, 
there is a being in the corner of my room with the name of Sammy Davis Jr. And when I leave my office, Sammy Davis Jr. might very well stay there and continue dancing. Um, and if anybody else were to come into my room right now, they would similarly experience this wonderful tap dance performance of Sammy Davis Jr. That's where the error and judgment would come. But if I say, look, I am seeing Sammy Davis Jr. tap dancing for me, there's nothing false about that. <laughs> it's a truth of my subjective awareness or experience. The falsity arises only when, as Descartes says, that um, the ideas which are in me, so my example of Sammy Davis Jr. tap dancing, are similar to or in conformity with certain things outside me, right? So we talked about all of these um, illusions, these kind of um, sensory illusions, optical illusions. That, that are quite familiar. So for example, if you put a stick in the water, it might appear bent. Um, and you can say, this stick appears bent to me right now. And that's not false, right? That's an accurate characterization of what you are visually experiencing. It's only false when you judge that the stick is in fact bent in the water, independently of the ways that you encounter it with your eyes, right? So does that's that make sense? Example. Huh? That's a really good example because if you go like bow fishing, like you have to shoot like below where you see the fish because where you see it is actually like a, you know, ping at the depth. That's usually like a, a foot to two foot discrepancy. So where you see the fish, you have to shoot like that and then you'll get the fish. Yeah, exactly. So you're taking into account whether you're conscious of this or not, um, that there is a gap between your experience of this particular reality and what that reality is independently of the experience. And so you have to adjust your practical approach or reaction to these phenomena on the basis of that observation or recognition. Um, can I so, offer something that's yeah, kind sure. of the same but opposite? It's also like your awareness of something can kind of uh, bridge that gap. Um, example, I did body work for like four years professionally, massage therapy and the craniosacral therapy with different kinds of more like you're working of layers of energy and then also anatomically you're working of real anatomical you know structures and then you're also working of layers of energy simultaneously just like your awareness that something exists whether it's metaphysical or biologically anatomically proven just your awareness will completely the body be aware that you're aware of it and it'll completely rearrange itself and so just like you could connect consciously with the mental plane to something that's biologically existing or we perceive as existing and it will react to your consciousness obviously that's completely not like a big woo but it is pretty amazing to just be aware of something and have it transform and change and be aware that's being aware of and just move with no physical touch just awareness it's yeah. pretty cool so yeah so um yeah thanks for that this so does this make sense, the problem with naive realism? If the naive realist is correct, then we could never be wrong about the content of our experiences. We would never make an error in judgment. And I'm talking specifically about a perceptual judgment. Um, but we're often mistaken. So because of a distance, for example, or a strange angle uh, from which you're perceiving some object, um, you might come to the conclusion that it's something that it isn't. Uh, so here is a model, a depiction of naive realism. So according to the model of naive realism, for perceptual experience, for consciousness as such to unfold, there have to be two essential components. So there is the subject or the perceiver and there is the object that is the perceived. So let's say this is you walking in a park around dusk and you encounter a tree before you. So you're the subject and the perceiver, you apprehend or visually perceive this object um, there before you and that's all there is. So somehow this object out in the world makes immediate contact <laughs> Uh, with your sensorium. So it sends out as the early moderns thought some kind of visual species which impacts on your retina 
and then gets um, translated to an immediate awareness of the thing before you. Um, but this is the model instead of representational realism, which introduces a third term, a third mediating term between subject and object. And so let's say you are walking into this park at night and maybe you're by nature a particularly fearful or anxious person. And because of um, the less than perfect lighting conditions, you maybe immediately perceive what is in reality a small tree, as it's shown here, as an assailant with a knife <laughs> lurking in the shadow. Well, in this case, <clears throat> rather than having a representation or an idea of the object or substance out there in the world, you would have a representation of a person with a knife. Uh, and so that would be an inaccurate representation. And that's how we would explain the error in judgment. You judge that there is a threatening person in the park with a knife, but then you get a little bit closer or perhaps you shine a light on it and you say, no, that's actually a tree. And now you have adjusted the misperception, the error in your judgment, and you have an accurate depiction of the real. Right? Okay. And so I mentioned that Descartes is a representational realist, but it was really John Locke who gave us the fleshed out systematic account of the representationalist model of, of the possibility of knowledge. Um, and so for Locke, you have one, the subject and the perceiver, two, the object or the perceived or the substance. And that substance is always understood as the bearer of various qualities or properties. And then we have the third term, which is a mediating point between one and two. Um, the idea or the representation. Uh, and so from the point of view of representational realism, we never make immediate contact with objects out there in the world given to our experience, but that contact is always mediated by a third term, which just as it discloses the real for us, at the same time stands in the way of an actual comprehension of the real as it is by itself in itself. In other words, independently of thought or experience. Uh, so before we move on, what is a problem with representational realism? So we already saw an issue with naive realism. If naive, if naive realism gives us an accurate picture of how we come to know things and navigate the world, well, then there's no way that we could ever be mistaken in our judgments. But of course, we are often mistaken in our judgments. Thus we come to representationalism or representational realism. But if representational realism is accurate and correct, what is a problematic consequence of this? I guess uncertainty of what is real and kind of right. being connected with what is real. As which I think one way to kind of solve that too is like having humility that, you know, when representational realism, like the Native American, there's like a, if we all stand around in a circle and there's a pumpkin in the center, we all see different facets of the pumpkin. So what you see is what your perception is and what they see is perception, you know, vary by every person that's standing around the pumpkin because everyone's seen a different part of it and have mm -hmm. a different experience of what the pumpkin is, its color, its shape, it's everything. Besides the shadow, that's the yeah. sun, like, you know, it's pretty consistent, you know, stars, astronomy. That's pretty. the truth of the pumpkin example. Did you get that from Brooke Colley? Yeah, Brooke, yeah. Cool, yeah, yeah, she's shared that with me. I really love that example. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so we can, we can maybe rely on other subjects to get a bigger picture. Um, so we only come to, and this is accurately shown here with respect to an object like a tree. When you encounter a tree in a park, you come at it from one angle and thus you have access to it only in terms of a limited profile, right? Um, but you, of course, phenomenologically presuppose that there is something on the other side, as it were, even if you have no immediate access to it. But if we were all to stand around in a circle, we could benefit from differential perspectives on the same phenomenon and get a, a more um, stable, more comprehensive view. Uh, but the problem is, um, even if you add up all of the different representations, which for their part are all limited 
to a particular angle or perspective, we're still dealing, even if intersubjectively here, we're still dealing with an intersubjective representation of the real, which may or may not be accurate. <laughs> so the skeptical worry that arises in the face of representationalism is if we never make direct contact with the real, but our knowledge and understanding of what is real is always mediated by this third term, this representation or idea, then how can we ever be sure with any degree of confidence that our representations or ideas accurately depict reality as such? It could be <laughs> that these representations and ideas are horrifically impoverished with respect to the real in itself, or even worse, perhaps horribly uh, manipulated or corrupted, completely different. Um, so then we always have to suspect that the real is withdrawn from us in terms of, of any confident or adequate understanding of what its nature involves or entails. Um, and so how did Locke respond to this worry or this issue? Well, we already talked about that in the context of Descartes. So um, drawing on Descartes, uh, for example, the ball of wax thought experiment from the second meditation, Locke says we need to distinguish primary qualities or properties from secondary qualities or properties. So how can we come to know that our representations are accurately representing the real of which they are ideas or representations? Well, through a process of a limited abstraction, according to Locke. So you take those secondary qualities, which remember are um, impossibly entangled with uh, our subjective um, awareness, our, our subjective powers or faculties, such as the color of the tree. So the green of the leaves, the brown of the limbs, uh, the sound, right? So the sound created by the wind whistling through the branches and the leaves, um, the, the smell, so you might, smell the cherry blossoms or something growing on the tree. Well, these are tied up inextricably with our subjective faculties of access to phenomena, which means that the color of the tree, given differences in lighting conditions and distance, might be very much different from the color that you experience in seeing the tree. The same goes with the sound and the smell. And if you were to break off a piece of bark or leaf and put it in your mouth, taste as well. So then um, these are the points of confusion for Locke. You need to eliminate, or in other words, abstract them away until all that remain are the so-called primary qualities, which are those objective mathematizable qualities, such as um, the weight, the mass, the volume, uh, the geometrical shape of the tree, and so forth. And once you apprehend those qualities, Locke says, you'll be able to come to terms truthfully with the objective state of affairs of the phenomenon or object that you are experiencing or perceiving. Um, so you can be confident that those qualities mirror the reality out there. Um, so that's Locke's idea. And he understands though <laughs> the object, so number two in this model, um, as a substance, which literally means that which sits below, so stands below, below in particular, the sensory qualities or properties by which we apprehend a thing as the thing that it is. So um, he posits that below the secondary as well as primary qualities, there is some substantial presence but he's at a loss for words to articulate exactly what this presence is. Locke says it's a je ne sais quoi, right? In the French, meaning it's an I know not what. There's something there beneath these qualities. Otherwise, they couldn't inherit anything or be given to our experience. So then Locke understands the substance or the object of these objects or, or points of contact, content in our experience in the metaphor or by the lights of the metaphor of a pin cushion, right? So number two here, the substance is like the pin cushion and it supports or holds and sustains um, all the various properties, secondary or primary, which in this metaphor are the pins that sit in the cushion, 
Um, but unlike the pincushion metaphor, which is why it doesn't really hold up, it doesn't really work, there is no pincushion that we have access to in our perceptual experiences. When you think about what is given in your perception of the tree outside your window, all you have access to are the determinate properties or qualities in accordance with which you know that there is this thing out there given to your consciousness. Without those qualities or properties, what more could there be? <laughs> what could this substance be underlying those properties? And so this is where we find George Barclay, the idealist, <laughs> comes into the picture. Uh, he would say, look, Locke, if you're being a strict, rigorous empiricist, and according to empiricism, if you remember, all that we know, all that we understand to be true is ultimately given through our sense experience, through our perceptual awareness of the world. And the substance in this model is something that we can never directly experience. Well, then what justification does someone like John Locke have to advance it as a reality that exists if it's beyond the possibility of experience? <laughs> so here's where we get Barclay. <laughs> here's idealism. We're down to two elements again, but instead of getting rid of the third term, the mediating term, the idea or the representation, Barclay annihilates the outside world. <laughs> Barclay says, look, whenever you observe, whenever you directly perceive, or whenever you are conscious of anything or think about anything, what is the irreducible, ineliminable, lowest common denominator that brings all of those experiences, whether cognitive, intellectual, or perceptual, sensory, into conformity? or identity? Well, it's the presence of an observer. It's the presence of one who thinks or one who perceives, right? So he says, look, it's the easiest thing in the world right now, and I'll, I'll do this Barclay and move. And so Barclay is the, the figure after whom um, Berkeley, UC Berkeley was named, very famous figure. Uh, he would say, okay, right now, and I'll ask you to do this, imagine a closet that's in a room of your house or your apartment. So think of a closet. Um, if you're like me, you're not entirely sure what's in any of your closets. It's some scary mess that at some point you hope to clean up. Uh, but maybe you have some sense of what's on a shelf in one of your closets, right? So now you can imagine, I mean, you're not at home, right? Or maybe you are at home. You are at home, what am I saying? So <laughs> imagine there's a closet, um, in some other room of your house where you are not right now, uh, but you can imagine it, you can um, picture perhaps, you can draw up an image of some object that's on a shelf in your closet. That's very easy to do. So you're thinking of a mind independent reality of something that's going on without a present observer to think or apprehend it. But what's actually going on there? What's really going on there? Barclay would say, you are abstracting from the content of your thinking, in this case, the shelf of a closet. You are abstracting or removing from the content of that experience, you as the observer, as the subject, but you haven't really eliminated or abstracted yourself <laughs> as the observer or the subject, because after all, it's you who's thinking of it, right? You're the one who's still thinking of your closet, of the objects that are on the shelf in your closet. So anytime there is a thought or a visual or other sense modality experience of some content in the world, the one factor that cannot be reduced or gotten rid of is the presence of a perceiver, right? And so um, in his challenge to luck, Barclay says, because this is an example that Locke uses. Uh, Locke says, all right, think of a triangle. Now, to get the true mathematical sense of the nature of a triangle, to really understand what a triangle is, you have to be able to think of, of an isosceles triangle, 
a right triangle, um, an obtuse triangle. Um, in short, every possible triangle that could ever be depicted. So every triangle, you have to imagine it, but um, not privileging any one of these examples of triangularity, right? So you have to imagine every triangle at once. And you also have to abstract away from this cognition of the triangle. If you wanna truly know what a triangle is, because we're trying to get to the primary qualities. You also can't think of a triangle as having any particular size or being any particular color or being any particular color against a different colored background, right? But Barclay says, all right, try this. See if you can do it. What Locke says you can do and you have to do to come to the truth that is the primary qualities of the triangle. Barclay says, you can't do it. <laughs> Anytime you think of a triangle, it's going to be this particular triangle of a particular size, of a particular color, and over a particular background. So Barclay's point is abstraction, which is the very process through which Locke says you get to the truth of things, is impossible. We can never abstract anything, um, whether primary or secondary qualities. So go back to the tree example. If Locke is correct, to be accurate or to be confident that your representation of this tree is accurate, you would have to eliminate, abstract away the secondary qualities of the color, the texture, the size, the sound, the smell, the taste, the feel. Well, once you abstract away all of those elements, you might ask with some good sense, well, what the fuck are you left with? <laughs> uh, the weight of it? Well, what is this abstract mathematical weight without the qualitative content, the specificity of the tree as a tree? which is disclosed for your experience as a tree because of all those other elements that Locke says we should forget about. <laughs> that is again, the color of the bark, the texture of the bark, the relation of the leaves to the branches and so forth. Um, so in this weird wild application of Occam's razor, the so-called principle of Occam's razor, is anyone familiar with that? So what is Occam's razor? Um, Occam's razor, I think it's like sometimes the easiest or simplest solution to a problem is the answer, I think. Uh, well, I could be wrong. Yeah, it's close. So the idea is given alternative interpretations or explanations for a given phenomenon, all other things being equal, the one that presupposes the fewest assumptions or that has the smallest number of premises. In other words, the more elegant alternative is the one to be preferred, right? So this doesn't necessarily mean that simplicity is key, that simplicity or elegance is preferred above all else, but um, other important considerations being equal, if one explanation seems to work, if it gives you an adequate um, account of the phenomenon being discussed or unpacked, and it presupposes fewer assumptions or takes fewer things for granted, well, that's the one that we ought to prefer. So what is Barclay doing here? He's applying Occam's razor, saying we never think about and we never encounter in our everyday experience even some mind independent reality. <laughs> Anytime there's the reality, lo and behold, there's your mind, <laughs> right? Um, so then why not just get rid of that second term, the reality in itself? So there's a lot of activity in the chat going on here. <laughs> um, okay. Okay, yeah, entities should not be multiplied without necessity. That's a good way to explain it too, right? So um, this kind of explanatory elegance. Um, Good. So then, does this mean that when I leave my office at the end of the day, because I'm no longer here to perceive it, that my office simply disappears? Does this mean when you close your eyes for a moment, the world as such is entirely obliterated, and then it's reconstituted 
when you open your eyes? So is this the absurd consequence that we should draw from Barclay? Um, how do you think he might respond to that? And keep in mind, we're talking about a bishop here. <laughs> so what do you suppose he would say about that? Uh, I see. So um, perhaps he would say everything is being perceived by um, God. Um, and so everything stays consistent when humans are not perceiving it. Yeah, that's right. So we got two versions of idealism in Berkeley, so-called subjective idealism and then objective idealism. So from the point of view of subjective idealism, everything I think and everything I experience through my so-called senses, which make contact to what I take to be an outside mind independent world is really just the content of my ideas, right? So even my visual apprehension of this coffee cup or the tactile feel of its weight in my hand are simply ideas in my own consciousness. But my very presence in the world as a conscious being is for its part an idea in the divine consciousness and is therefore rendered objective um, in the presence of my body, so to speak, for all of you. Uh, and so God is the constant observer who never blinks, who never sleeps, and thus is never at risk of annihilating the very world that we take for granted, right? Um, but what's the problem with that? So recall Barclay's critique of Locke, that Locke was not being um, a rigorous empiricist because of his positing of these things in themselves, uh, these substances that underlie qualities, even though we never access these substances. And that is to say, if empiricism is true and that everything we know has to be given to us through sense um, engagement, uh, sensation, sense experience, well then how can these um, substances be found to exist? So what do you think Hume is going to say about Barclay's idealism? So how do you think um, another empiricist might criticize uh, so-called objective idealism? Well, we don't have any sensory information, just like we don't have any uh, sensory in information about substance. We don't have sensory information about a God that is omnipotent and always perceiving things. Um, Although he's a bishop, Barclay was a bishop, which means he probably would argue against that. Um, but if you don't already believe in um, some omnipotent God, then it might throw Barclay's idealism kind of out the window. Yeah, so Hume is going to up the ante here of a more um, faithful and ultimately, as we'll see by its implications, hyperbolic or extreme empiricism because of which he'll ultimately reject metaphysics as such. <laughs> um, he'll want to overcome metaphysics and set it aside. And this is where we encounter um, a kind of tendency that began with Descartes, but has been pushed to the extreme at this point in the 18th century by Hume, um, known now as the epistemological turn, uh, where in the 17th century, we started to turn our collective philosophical gaze or focus on matters of knowledge rather than um, uh, some overarching metaphysical view of the real. And so if we could locate Hume somewhere in a combination between those two categories of metaphysics, um, um, so realism and idealism, and the two categories within the domain of epistemology, so rationalism and empiricism, well, Hume is neither a realist or an idealist. He wants to close the door on metaphysical speculation altogether, but he's a strict empiricist when it comes to epistemology. So when it comes to a question as to the truth of an external world, of a reality that exists independently of our knowledge, Hume would simply say, well, that's a meaningless question, right? All we have access to are our impressions, ultimately. And so um, it's impossible to disentangle the so-called objective state of affairs from the qualitative content of our impressions. So um, he doesn't take the hard, um, surprising conclusion of Berkeley, which says 
there is no mind independent reality. That's too strong. He doesn't think that that kind of conclusion is warranted or justified. But at the same time, he distances himself from what he takes to be Locke's unwarranted realist uh, commitment. That is to say, there are these mind independent substances, even if we access them only through the mediated um, engagement with their properties, uh, primary and secondary. Okay. okay. So does that make sense? All right. So we're back to, so now we're getting into to Hume specifically. So this is what we picked up from our previous engagement with Hume, this distinction between impressions and ideas. And that's uh, the distinction with which he begins section two of the inquiry. Uh, and so impressions are distinguishable by the outward which is um, what he characterizes as sense perception or sensation, my ability to perceive objects out there in the world, and then feeling, so emotion, sentiment, which would be inward impressions, um, the conditions of my passion, for example, and passion is often used in these um, early modern contexts instead of, of emotion. Um, and then ideas are always the faint copies of original sense impressions. So for Hume, there can be no idea without some um, first sense perceptual engagement with a phenomenon. Um, that is to say, an impression. And again, we're closing off the consideration or speculation as to whether there is um, any mind independent basis for these sensory and cognitive impressions. Um, and so, his rejection of metaphysics, let's see. you can get some expression of that in section two on page nine in our reading, where he says, so when we come to suspect that a philosophical term is being used without any meaning or idea, as happens all too often, we need only to ask, from what impression is that supposed idea derived? If none can be pointed out, that will confirm our suspicion that the term is meaningless, i.e. has no associated idea. So in response to Locke, he would say, okay, you have this idea of substance. Well, when have you ever encountered this reality through one or another sense impression? Well, you haven't. Your sense impressions only give you qualities or properties. And to, to Berkeley, he would say, when have you ever had an impression that could give rise to this idea of God? Well, there is no such impression. And so then you should suspect that these terms, which are supposed to track some kind of idea with which we're thinking in our consciousness, that these ideas are empty. Right? They're without any material origin or basis, and they thus should be rejected. And he's being a, a little more, more humble in this particular case, as we, we find Hume in the inquiry. Whereas, in contrast, in the treatise on human nature, he says, um, and I mentioned this last time, you can go into the library, pick up any book, on, let's say metaphysics or whatever else, and anytime you encounter an idea which cannot in principle be traced back to some original sense experience, then you can know with an extreme degree of confidence that that idea is complete bullshit and you should toss it out, <laughs> right? Um, so that's, that's where, we, where we've come now in Hume's radical empiricism. So next, we get what's referred to in the literature as Hume's fork. And this doesn't refer to like um, the utensil that you use for eating dinner, but instead like a fork in the road. And so all knowledge, and this is Hume's extreme empiricism, all knowledge according to Hume comes from two sources and is of uh, two distinct natures. So relations of ideas versus matters of fact. And relations of ideas is what we characterized at the beginning of today's session by appeal to the concept of a priori truth or a priori knowledge. So all knowledge 
as knowledge of relations of ideas is necessarily by definition a priori. And this means certain. So just like I can know two plus two equals four a priori, that is independently of any experience where I am bringing together two things here and two things here to generate the sum of four, I can know that two plus two equals four with absolute certainty. So a prioricity grounds epistemic certainty. And that's why, for example, Descartes can say, I think therefore I am, and I know that to be true, absolutely and with complete certainty. It's necessarily true. Um, that's just a different way of putting its a prioricity, its status as being a priori knowable. Um, so all relations of ideas are certain, they, they cannot be doubted. It's not just that they're so familiar or obvious that it's difficult in terms of our ordinary experience to doubt them. They cannot by definition be doubted. They are a priori and they are necessarily true. Um, and this is just a way of saying analytically true. So in logic, um, logicians talk about necessary truth, analytic truth, and logical truth. So those are three synonyms, which amount to the same thing. And um, if you ever take a, a course in formal deductive logic, you'll see these um, weird tables that get generated to evaluate the truth status of different sentences or propositions or expressions known as truth tables. So you can take any ordinary English language proposition, you can translate it to formal terms, and then you can take that proposition in its symbolic language or representation and put it in a truth table. And um, a sentence like this, either I'm standing uh, or I'm not standing, um, that's always going to be true, no matter what. So there is no context, there's no situation in the world in which that can be falsified. You're either standing or you're not standing. It's raining or it's not raining. Um, that's a true sentence. It's either raining or it's not raining. It's always going to be true. Um, but a sentence like, the coffee cup is on the table. Sometimes that's true and sometimes it's false. So in the little table, uh, you'll see T, 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 F, F, F. So true, 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 false, 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 depending on the context. But it's raining or it's not raining. That's always going to be true. So you'll just see T's all the way down. And then when it comes to um, a contradiction, that's the exact opposite of a necessary analytic or logical truth. That's when um, it's always false. So if I say, for example, um, <clears throat> A and not A instead of or. So I am standing and I'm not standing. So if you replace the or with the and, it now becomes a necessary falsity or a contradiction. And we can know this by logic because logic is uh, one of these intellectual um, domains or knowledge domains in which one deals with relations of ideas. But in those contexts, just like in mathematics, one is not dealing with any um, material experiential, that is experiential or experienceable content out there in the world. One is simply dealing with ideas um, and how they connect to each other in various fashions. Um, so mathematical um, concepts are relational concepts that allow us to think about the content that we're dealing with mathematically um, in ways that ground us in knowledge, um, that is to say confidence or falsity. Uh, so then this is why, for example, two plus two equals four, we say that's true necessarily, but what exactly is two? What exactly is four? What exactly is, is addition? These are not phenomena. These are not things that you can stumble over. Like, oh, I tripped over a three on my way to class today. Um, these are relations between ideas, which for their part are derived from what we call facts. So the experienced content of our sensory engagement with the world. Um, 
So what are some examples of relations of ideas? Well, deductive logic. So this is Aristotle's principle of non-contradiction. It's always false. So this is where we get that eventuality um, of an outcome in the truth table that I referred to. This is always going to be false, um, A and not A. Uh, it's impossible, it's inconceivable that I can be standing and not standing at the same time. Two plus two equals four. So just like this principle of non-contradiction, it's absolutely certain, knowable a priori. So I can just deal with these abstract variables. I don't even have to think about real um, states of affair in the world, like standing or not standing, or reigning and not reigning. That's because these truths are necessary. They're always true. Um, and here's an example specifically of an analytically true sentence. Bachelors are unmarried males. So why is this an analytically true sentence? And this is an example of knowledge of relations of ideas. So what is, we'll do a little grammar here. What's the subject of this sentence? Say that again? Bachelors, yeah. Yeah, bachelors. And what is the predicate? So there's not much left in the sentence. <laughs> oh, predicate. Oh, go in. Is it R? Well, that's the verb. Now, predicate involves a verb. Uh, but in this case, what is the verb R doing? Um, well, it is predicating a quality of the subject. So just like if I said, the table is hard, the is is an is of predication. So in other words, it is uh, describing or circumscribing by appeal to some descriptor what the subject is or what it's doing in the context of the sentence. Um, so to know that this is an analytically true and that it's an analytic statement um, in general, you have to evaluate the relationship between the subject and the predicate. So what is the relationship between the subject and the predicate here? So I am predicating the status of unmarried maleness to the subject bachelor. Well, the relation is this. The predicate is simply the result of an analysis of the subject, nothing more. And what does it mean to analyze something? It means to take a simple whole and to break it down or to open it up, as it were, into its constitutive parts. So I'm taking the subject here, bachelor, as a whole, which is a concept, and I'm opening it up, I'm analyzing it to show the very concepts out of which it is made, which would involve um, a particular status of, of being unmarried and which attaches to one particular uh, gender in our language, in our conceptual vocabulary or apparatus through which these concepts are, are deployed. So then um, this sentence is always true because to be a bachelor just means to be an unmarried male. And to verify the truth of the sentence, you don't have to interview a series of persons who claim to be bachelors. You don't have to say, oh, you're a bachelor? So are you a male? Are you unmarried? If someone's a bachelor, by definition, they're an unmarried male. And if you encounter someone who is an unmarried male, they're by definition a bachelor, which is why the sentence is always already true, no matter the context. Um, but compare that to a sentence like, the coffee cup is on the table. In this case, the subject is coffee cup, and the predicate is um, a spatial prepositional predicate. So the predicate is, is on the table. Um, but what is the relationship between subject, coffee cup, and predicate on the table? Uh, well, there's no essential relationship to observe at all, right? There is no, there's nothing in the concept of coffee cup that necessarily points you to the concept of table. 
and vice versa, right? Um, or a sentence like, um, <clears throat> uh, well, we can just use this one. The sun will rise tomorrow. Um, the futural event of the sun coming to rise is not necessarily essential to the very concept of the sun, right? Um, so then to verify the truth of that sentence, you require an act of synthesis, not analysis. So if I say the coffee cup is on the table, then I have to synthesize the subject, coffee cup and the predicate on the table. They're not already together to be broken up or analyzed. I have to synthesize them. And when I do that, when I bring them together, I can say, okay, now it's true. The sentence is true that the coffee cup is on the table, but now it's false. Um, so does that make sense? The difference between sentences that are analytically true versus synthetically true? And so the contrary, when it comes to relations of ideas, the contrary cannot be conceived of without contradiction. So this is the major upshot by which to understand what's going on in this distinction that Hume provides. Uh, so what I have in bold here, the contrary of any of these categories that fall under relations of ideas, the contrary cannot be conceived of at all without contradiction. I cannot even think of what it would, li would look like for two plus two to equal seven. I can't even um, approach that idea um, either closely or farly. It just makes no sense to me. Um, so when it comes to deductive logic, I can't even conceive of, it, of what it would be like for me to be able to be standing and not standing simultaneously. And I cannot even conceive of a bachelor who it turns out is not an unmarried male, right? So the contrary cannot be conceived of without contradiction. But when it comes to matters of fact, here we're talking about, and so what we're gonna gain clarity on this week is what it even means for something to be a fact at all. What is a fact? Uh, well, when it comes to matters of fact, we're dealing with phenomena that are uncertain and thus to be verified have to be grounded in some experienceable um, state of impressions. That is a particular relationship of experience between a subject or a mind um, and perhaps we could say, although Hume doesn't want to go this far, some content of the outside world that we approach or navigate. Uh, and so matters of fact, for example, the coffee cup is on the table. That's uncertain. Um, if someone tells me the coffee cup is on the table, I might take their word for it because it seems to be a strange thing to lie about. Uh, but I can't be 100% certain um, unless I have verified it through observation and experience, right? So um, it's uncertain, and that is something that you would find, again, going back to that truth table model, depending on the context, it's TTT or FFF, sometimes true, sometimes false. In other words, it's contingent. So the truth of the sentence the cup is on the table is contingent upon my experienceable confirmation of the fact. It's still a matter of fact. So whether or not the coffee cup is on the table is a matter of fact. So that's why he uses that um, language. But once I verify it, the coffee cup is on the table, it becomes a fact. Um, but the question as to its status in the world and how I come to know that status is one of a matter of fact, which makes it fundamentally different from how we encounter knowledge in the area of relations of ideas. So unlike relations of ideas, where we encounter deductive logic, mathematics, conceptual definitions, matters of fact are knowable a posteriori. So this is the converse of the term a priori. Whereas two plus two equals four can be known with absolute certainty, independently of my sense experience. Something like the coffee cup is on the table can only be known a posteriori. In other words, after 
the experience, dependent on, contingent on the experience in itself. And this is why sentences like the sun will rise tomorrow or the coffee cup is on the table um, or there are 22 pages to this text um, or the back of my phone is white. Uh, these are all matters of fact. And when they're articulated in these sentences, in this linguistic expression, they're always synthetically true, which means that you can't get to the predicate of the sentence simply by analyzing the subject, by breaking it open. And so what goes into our knowledge of matters of fact, or how do we come by knowledge of matters of fact? Well, first of all, through observation and experience. So the question as to where the cup is, is a matter of fact. I see that the cup is on the table. I've now observed it to be true. Um, cause and effect. So one example um, that we can turn to and we will turn to later, you walk into a room, a very dark room, so you can't see anything at all, but you hear a voice, you hear someone say something. So without even thinking about it, you come to the conclusion that there's another person in the room. Um, and if someone asked you, well, how did you come to that conclusion? You didn't actually see a person in the room. You didn't experience a person in the room. You would say, well, I heard a voice. And a voice is the effect of the cause, which is a human person. Thus, I infer on the basis of what I did experience. So the auditory sound of a voice, I infer that there must be a person who caused that voice as an effect. Uh, so that's cause and effect. Um, and it's through cause and effect observations, through unpacking cause and effect relationships that we attain truth through the pathway, the logical pathway of induction, which is very much different from deduction. Um, so an example of inductive logic would be, the sun will rise tomorrow. Uh, but how does someone arrive at that conclusion? And I think, um, at least I suspect this to be the case, Perhaps we all take this conclusion for granted <laughs> that the sun will rise tomorrow. Um, and we looked at this example before when working briefly through logic, before I think digging deeply into Descartes. Uh, but why, and this is one way to define inductive logic, any conclusion of an inductive argument is always by definition going to be deductively invalid. So every inductive conclusion fails the test of deductive validity. Um, and why is that? So how do we come to this conclusion that the sun will rise tomorrow? And why can we not know that as a relation of ideas or a priori or as certain? Well, the reason we at least I uh, kind of think or assume that the sun is going to rise tomorrow is because it's risen every other day that we've, you know, experienced the morning. Um, but I guess that that experience isn't technically like necessarily true uh, or like part of our the sun's relationship to, um, you know, our day, I guess. Yeah, so you're observing in the morning, you go outside or you look through your window, the sun has risen. Um, you remember that the sun has risen yesterday. <laughs> it, it rose the day before, the day before, extending all the way back into the murky recesses of your earliest memories. And then you rely upon <laughs> um, the uh, testimony of others, the testimony of history more broadly, that the sun has behaved in this way over countless millennia. Right now, of course, we know that the sun isn't actually rising, that what we take to be the sun rise and set is uh, a kind of illusion caused by the movement of the earth. <laughs> but we're just using this, this language uh, for simplicity's sake, right? But the problem is, and this is why the conclusion that the sun will rise tomorrow fails the test of deductive validity, is because we have never experienced the future. Right? So all of those premises that would give you confidence that the sun will in fact predictably arise tomorrow morning 
um, all of those premises are from your past or from the historical past more generally. Yet the claim, the conclusion is about what will happen tomorrow. Uh, so to be deductively valid, the conclusion of your argument cannot introduce any new ideas or any new content that were not already supplied by the premises, right? So a deductive conclusion is simply unpacking or giving direct expression to what was already presupposed or implied in the premises. Uh, yet there's nothing about the sun's behavior tomorrow um, that we have necessarily experienced directly in the course of our past. So it fails the test of deductive validity, yet we still think that it will rise tomorrow with a strong degree of confidence. And that's because of the overwhelming plurality of evidence that we do draw from our own past and from history more generally that seems to point in the direction of that eventuality, right? So just because it fails the test of logical validity, we still um, embrace that particular conclusion with a strong degree of self-confidence, and we should, because it's an inductively cogent or strong argument. Um, but, and this is the case for all inductive reasoning, however confident we are about it, let's say we're 99.9999% certain that the sun will rise tomorrow, it can never reach the level of 100% certainty or indubitability, right? So then, and this is the last thing I'll say, we'll pick this up on Thursday. According to Hume, here's the human condition, right? We are torn between two irreducible, um, that is exhaustive possibilities for knowing the world. On the one hand, we can know things with absolute indubitable certainty. We can come to necessary a priori truths, but <laughs> these, certain necessary a priori truths are only truths about the relationship between our own ideas that we have and that we frequently leverage or necessarily leverage in order to get about um, the world and to make sense of it. But the certainty of this knowledge doesn't tell us anything about reality, right? So the fact that we call certain individuals bachelors doesn't really tell us anything about the world. It's only important for us because we have these categories or concepts such as marriage and gender or, or sex um, in terms of biological identity. Uh, but those are just concepts, right? Those aren't anything that have to do necessarily with the real world. And then on the other side, matters of fact. Here we get knowledge that does tell us about the real world. It is substantive, it is truly informative, but it's always already no matter the context, uncertain and possibly false. <laughs> so that's the human condition where we find ourselves. Um, and we'll build on that uh, a little bit more to get into specifically the problem of induction. And that's a problem for the certainty of our ordinary sense experience. And also more significantly, a problem for the justification of science. Modern science as we know it relies upon more than deduction, inductive reasoning. So what we make of our scientific experimental observations. And so Hume is going to call that very justificatory ground into question, as we'll see. Um, all right, so are there any final comments or questions? For God, I've really kept you a few minutes over and I apologize yeah. about that. Well, it kind of seems like you almost have to turn to like spirituality to like have something that's more concrete and obviously spirituality is very different amongst every individual. So there's actually nothing concrete about that, but it's like at least gives you something that uh, can anchor the reality that this existence may be somewhat illusionary or just so fleeting that, you know, there's time is, you know, time itself has scientific findings that show it's not really what we think it to be. And so, yeah, it's a it's an interesting topic for sure. Cool, cool, I'm glad you're enjoying it. Well. Um... Uh, so I won't keep you guys any longer. Thanks for bearing with me and I will see you guys Thursday and we'll talk more about Hume and then we'll get into this creepy um, kind of horror story by Guy de Maupassant. So uh, I'll see you guys on Thursday. I'll be here for a moment if you have a minute. Oh, cool. hey, Justin. Oh, did you want to say something before? Uh
Yeah, just just briefly. Um, okay. Yes, so um, yeah, I think I'm too resilient for my own good. It's been freaking wild. Um, so I'll just say that. 